Louisiana Legends is made possible by Blue Cross and Blue Shield of Louisiana. This informative educational series enables us to discover, through the accomplishments of our fellow Louisianians, the unique character of the state so proudly served by Blue Cross and Blue Shield of Louisiana for more than 65 years. drilling here had the old handbrake and it'd slack off. You could kind of tell by the squealing, you know, how much it slack off. The story of Alden J. Doc Laborde and the story of Louisiana's offshore oil and gas industry are practically one and the same. The people that know the industry know, know the Labordes. And one of the oil industry's greatest inventions might never have existed if it had not been born in the imagination of Doc Laborde. What Mr. Charlie did was to demonstrate that a unit could be successfully floated out, submerged the bottom right side up, and kept in place during the drilling of a well. They were tough days, but exciting days. Before Mr. Charlie, companies built platforms in shallow water and simply placed a land derrick on top. And obviously that was not a very efficient way to do it, and that was limited to the very shallow water. Uh, it was quite apparent to those in the business that we needed a better way to do that, something that could move around and not have to be disassembled and rebuilt at each location. Despite rejections from the major oil companies of the day, Doc and a group of smaller investors took the idea from blueprint to blue water. Doc developed other innovations, such as the ocean driller, the first floating deep water rig. He built Odico, the offshore drilling and exploration company, and somehow found time to have a family. But as far as he had traveled in the business world, Doc Laborde has never forgotten where he came from, the foundation he still stands on even to this day. In charitable causes, in church work, also in community life, and particularly in the military. But above all, a wonderful, loving husband and father. My Catholic upbringing was one of the important influences in my life starting from the time that I was a child. A loving family that gave him the values Doc Laborde needed to survive and thrive in war, peace, and the dog-eat-dog -dog world of the oil business. I like him to think that I was a square shooter and honest, and I think that's very important in business. In the long run, that's but you have to be in business, and uh, I certainly buy that and try to live by it. I am uh, with a man who I have permission from. I want to put everybody at ease. I asked Alden J. Doc Laborde, what should I call him for purposes of this interview? And I'll give you an idea of what kind of guy he is. He said, Doc. So, Doc, welcome to Louisiana Legends. Well, thank you, Gus, if I can call you Gus. <laughs> <laughs> the only thing I could call is worse things. Doc, uh, growing up in Marksville, Louisiana, y'all's life, uh, I read in your biography, was kind of considered modern. Y'all had electric lights running water, a phone, and an automobile. But the most interesting story, y'all had that radio. And when there was something big going on, like a, a prize fight, a heavyweight fight, a lot of folks would gather around that radio. Well, that's right. I'm surprised you remembered that. The people would come from town, and we had all these dials on that radio, and it was mostly static, but somebody had an ear to it. And every now and then he'd hear that Jack Dempsey had gotten in a lick on Gene Tooney or somebody, right. and so he'd shout it out to the crowd. Or if it was the World Series, Babe Ruth had, had gotten another hit or something, and so he'd kind of interpret what was coming through the static. Right. Through the static. Right. And you it had all these dials to 
It was that way in Lafayette, too. I'm sure. There just weren't that many radios, huh? No. No, they weren't. Sir, uh, you graduated from uh, high school there in... In Marksville. In Marksville. And uh, the Depression was... And uh, you headed for Louisiana State University in Baton Rouge. And I thought it was fabulous, traveling in the back of an open bed furniture truck. Is that correct? <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> uh, Franklin Roosevelt had just uh, abolished prohibition. Huey Long was the governor. Right. Now, what y'all think of Huey? Well, uh, probably didn't do a lot of thinking about anything in those days as a kid, but I do remember him out there at the LSU games. He was out there in, that white, in his white suit, marching ahead of the band with a baton leading the crowd. and. Uh, he did a lot of things for LSU and for the students. He took the whole student body to Nashville, I think, for a game that year. And he, a little later on, I think he made the star football player a state senator, if you remember, Abe Michael and Abe all that. Abe Michael. So he, he did a lot. He helped to build the university. Uh, my father was not uh, in sympathy with his ideas and ideals and, and politics. and. Uh, so we inherited a good bit of that, but I'm trying to give him credit for some of the positive things. He did. Uh, then you went from LSU to the Naval Academy. That's right. And uh, graduated from there as an ensign. But you were released from service after two years because of your eyesight. That's all correct. Even though that was in 1940, the... Uh, reserves were being mobilized and the North were Atlantic Patrol was... Yes, I was. I, I was going to make a career of the Navy, although it was somewhat accidental. I didn't have any great ambitions about the Navy. I had actually heard more about West Point and had tried to go to West Point, but then Senator Overton told me he didn't have any vacancies that year. But he did have something at the Naval Academy, and he says, that's just as good. I said, okay, I'll try I'll that. So that's how my uh, so career then, decision was made. But then when I was released, they were still on peacetime rules. You had to be 2020 uncorrected to be a Naval officer in those days. And uh, I didn't quite make that standard after the two years. And so out I came, even though the war was brewing and we could see it coming. And you, you came back, you went to Lafayette, my hometown. That's right where you uh, started a business and met your future wife, that's right. Margaret. I guess that's what it was all about. Fate had a hand in that. You remember then, since you're from Lafayette, a fellow named Fred Nurbass. Oh, a my fellow goodness. Who had, uh, yes. backed me in this little warehouse business. Uh, wow. Over on the Southern Pacific tracks there. Yes, sir. And that was just beginning to get going when the war started again. And as a reserve officer, I got called back in. And, and how did you spend your, your military time? I first uh, went to uh, Miami where they had opened up a, a called a sub chaser training center. The Atlantic submarine war was real hot during the first few months. The, the uh, German submarines had a virtual turkey shoot off the East Coast. We had no anti-submarine vessels at all. So I went there for a few weeks and then got command of what they called a PC boat. It was a 173 foot steel hull vessel equipped with depth charges and what have you and operated convoy runs from New York to Trinidad for six or eight months. By then, larger ships, anti-submarine vessels were coming out, destroyer escorts, which is a destroyer really equipped for you know, anti-submarine work. And I got command of one of those. Uh, my naval experience was such that they just didn't have people to man these ships, especially command them. I was obviously not ready for any of this. Here's a guy, I was about 27 years old. Wow. Here was a ship with 320 people and going across the... For whose lives you were responsible. Right, and so it was a pretty heavy burden. But anyway, I did that for a couple of years in the North Atlantic up until I made one trip after the invasion and then I was relieved again and I got command of a... Of a called an APD, a, a special service uh, destroyer for uh, underwater demolition work. We got in on the tail end of Okinawa and we were really preparing for the invasion of Japan. 
and mercifully the atomic bomb was dropped and that ended the need for these underwater demolition and that whole Navy. That, that war would have gone on for a very long time without I'm dropping I'm sure that. if the emperor had uh, told the people to resist house to house, it would have lasted a long time. I won't put a number on it. And there would have been untold losses. We'd have killed more than millions of Americans and we'd have killed as many millions of Japanese as were willing to die as long as the emperor would have told them to do that. But one Harry S. Truman didn't see it that way about waiting and he dropped that bomb and that ended that war. Yes, that, that saved millions of lives in my judgment. Both and sides. I've, mm -hmm. uh, that was, I guess, the biggest day of my life because I think I was in, in an expendable operation. We already had our operating orders for the invasion of Japan and we were to go in a couple of weeks before and try oh to my. feel out, blow up the, the reefs for the invasion group to come <laughs> working at night and then pulling our uh, frogmen out for the daytime now, sir, and trying to draw fire and see where the, the <laughs> fire points were. Oh my goodness, that, that does not sound like the kind of duty that I would have desired. Uh, sir, uh, you went then into the uh, oil industry with Kerr McGee I in Morgan City. No, I didn't really start there. I, I started, I, when I first came out, it was, you know, find a job. I had a wife, kids, and needed a job. Get a job. And had no experience other than the Navy. So I went to work for a, a seismograph crew, you know what that is, yes, up sir. in the Vos Parish. There was a shooting crew there, and I got a job as a helper on the jug line, you know, dragging these cables and jugs around the swamps and what have you. But I then, after a few months, got a job with Sid Richardson, the oil company. They were starting a, an exploration program down here in um, Plaquemine Parish. Yes, sir. And they're building a, what, we, not, what we call a swamp barge. He didn't know much about this business. He thought he needed a, some kind of naval person to help with that, which he didn't really. But, and since I had some naval experience, he hired me and I was sort of the head roustabout on that rig and was involved in moving it about and maintaining it and that sort of thing. And after a couple of years, this was in 1948 by then, uh, I heard about Kerr McGee's discovery offshore and I figured, well, kind of here's my chance to use my naval background and marine background. and. Uh, so I went to work there as a marine superintendent handling the boats and the tugs and the barges and that sort of stuff. I'd like to know about how Odico came into being and Mr. Charlie. Now, uh, uh, some folks will know about Mr. Charlie, but I guess this year is kind of Mr. Charlie's dad. Would you tell us how, how that got going? When I was with Kerr McGee, it was obvious we were doing this in a pretty awkward way. The approach to offshore drilling then and it was all shallow water, was to build a piling platform and make a deck and then in effect create a little land out there and put a land rig on it and service it with marine stuff. Uh, that was obviously not a good way to do it. You usually drill a dry hole and you had to abandon the platform, clear the site in a very expensive way. It was obvious we needed something that could move about. Um, I had the idea that we could build a submersible barge in effect was a, a floating hull with tall legs and then an upper deck about 75 feet above that, go out and sink this lower hull to bottom but have the working deck about 40 feet above the water so the waves could go through the column. That was your idea? Uh, yes, it was, although it was a, kind of an obvious idea. The, the key to it was how to keep it right side up while it was going down. That got into some naval architecture principles, had to build columns there to stabilize it so it worked kind of like a dry dock, but still transparent so the waves could go through. It was, it was my notion and I thought it would work. And uh, I tried to talk Dean McGee, who was running Kerr McGee Oil Company at that time, into building one for Kerr McGee. And he said, well, you know, it sounded like a good idea, but he was not willing to undertake it at that time for whatever reason. So I said, well, I think I'll resign and go try to promote it elsewhere. So that's what I did. I took, a, I resigned and I packed a briefcase and started up and down the coast, which was the obvious place to go. I went to all the major oil companies, but they all had all these batteries of engineers to uh, 
say what was wrong or to answer questions I couldn't answer. I didn't have really anything at risk. I had no money and no reputation, so I had nothing to lose. But uh, the executives of major oil companies who were running a division down here had worked their way up the ladder by clean, keeping their noses clean and not taking too many chances. So I was not being successful. But through circumstances and all, after about six months, I ran into uh, uh, the Murphy Oil people in El Dorado, Arkansas. They were a small independent oil company interested in getting offshore but not knowing how. And since I came from down here and they were up there, it sounded like I knew what I was talking about. And so they said, well, let's see if we can't put it together. Well, I needed $2 million to build the first rig, but I had about half of it financed with supply companies and a uh, shipyard. So they said, we'll put up half a million if you can raise the other half. But that triggered the other half, or got a group of investors who put $50,000 a piece, 10 of them, that made us a million dollars, and we went ahead. We organized Odico, and Murphy owned half of it. And it went from there, it kind of, its own momentum overwhelmed us from that point, and they kept the, the market and business and the board and Murphy kept pushing us faster than I was ready to go. First for more of these shallow water units than for deeper water units. And then the, that technology of sitting on bottom and something reaching above the water soon ran out of legs. The things would just get too massive, so we had to figure out some floating method. And I think that was really more of a risky breakthrough than the, the first Mr. Charlie was. Uh, that was the ocean driller that we built, which was the first uh, purpose-built semi-submersible rig. It was floating and moored, and therefore it wasn't limited to a particular water depth. It was just a matter of reasonable moorings and that sort of thing. So with that, we could go out and drill in five or 600 feet of water. And even and today, of course, that same technology has been expanded where they're drilling in many thousands of feet of water. But that's kind of the story. But I think the, the first semi-submersible was uh, a bigger breakthrough. It doesn't have quite the ring first like Mr. Charlie did, but it, it was indeed a, a big Then Odico became an international yacht. It yes, was it did. It became the biggest in the world. It wound up with 42 rigs running all around the world at one point. Doc, I want to ask you a kind of an abstract question, but I really am fascinated. I've interviewed your brother, and I'm interviewing you. What? I a a and you told me y'all had two way more successful brothers. Uh, uh, what, what was it about the Labords that just kind of made y'all into, I don't know what word to use. Uh, I'm going to embarrass you. There's some genius uh, uh, present. But what was it about y'all? What? Well, it's, it's not genius, I can assure you. But... Uh, I think if I have to give credit, it would be to my parents who uh, instilled in us, number one, hard work, uh, get ahead. We were not embarrassed by the idea that you, you work hard and get ahead and, as they said, make something out of yourself. Today, yeah. that's kind of uh, not politically correct because that's not fair to the other guy who, on whose shoulders you might be stepping to get ahead. But that, that hadn't occurred to them. You know, we were nearer to the ground than that in those days. Secondly, uh, uh, my father and mother instilled in us a, a strong religious faith, but it was, it was lived, uh, you know, in morality and what have you. And I think that's a, a, an important basis in business. I think uh, businesses that speed and reach out and, don't, and aren't uh, properly run morally and otherwise uh, they seem to flourish for a while, but if you look around, they'll be, they'll be gone in a few years. And uh, so I think uh, it, it's hard work, and it's you know honest business, and it's it's hard nosed business when it needs to be, but it's above board and honest. And if you get it. were a young guy right now, the year two thousand, and you were looking for a career future. What, what would you go into, do you know? No, I have no idea. Because I believe these things kind of happen to you. You know, like 
the way I got into the Navy, I told you, was because I couldn't get into West Point. That was my first career decision. And then the way I got out was not my decision. I wound up in Lafayette because I knew Fred Nurbath. I got back in the Navy because of the war. I didn't make any of these decisions, really. It's just circumstances. Uh, I picked the lady I've been living with for the last 56 years, somewhat accidentally, you might say. You know, you kind of run into them, and <laughs> things work, and next thing you know, you're married. And uh, these are not really sound decisions. They just sort of happen, and they're the important things. You can decide uh, what necktie you're going to wear in the morning, or, you know, the little things. But as far as the big thing in life, I think they pretty well happen to us. You expose yourself. Now, you retired from running Otico. Right. present CEO of the whole thing, which is a another huge beyond imagination that, that the most of his company. But you said you stayed retired for about two weeks. It didn't quite work, did it, for you? Well, n no, it didn't. I don't think my wife was ready. Uh, there was no lunch around the house. No <laughs> one was ever home. And so I decided that that wasn't it. At that time, I still was on several corporate boards yes, sir. and I was involved in several civic boards, a couple of universities and that sort of thing. So it took a good bit of time and satisfied my need for interests. But I, most of those make you get off when you're 70, 72 years old. And again, by almost accidental circumstances, I wound up with this opportunity to buy, a, uh, be a part of a group that bought a, uh, offshore fabrication yard over in Homer, Louisiana in 1985. That was uh, in the oil field slump. It was in bankruptcy. And with some other investors, we bought it out of bankruptcy and got it started up. And that occupied my attention. And ha it's become a substantial business today. It's in the public. It's, it's publicly marketed. And uh, I'm chairman of the board of that. And directly involved in You're that You're just not operation. going to escape responsibility quite often. And obviously. I've also taken some of my little savings and put them in, an oil, in some oil and gas exploration activities that one of my sons runs, and I, I try to stay interested in that. Sir, you are very much, and he is very much like you, like your brother. What would you say are, are, are the main differences in, in you and your brother? John was a lawyer yes. working for an oil company. Yes, sir. And it, with a small group of people, I figured there was a better way to build these offshore boats than what we were doing. And we were using mostly war surplus vessels. And the novelty, if you will, of the first one was to put all the wheelhouse and uh, the quarters and all up forward and leave the whole back deck clear. That, that, that There were good reasons for that because of as you know, the propellers and rudders on the boat are on the, on the back end, on the stern, and that's the end you can maneuver. And that's the end you had to get to a rig and hold it there so they could lift stuff off without running into the rig. And so it, it was pretty obvious that was a way to do it, but it was a strange-looking boat, and people laughed at it when it came out. All of these things were pretty obvious, but they all have one thing in common. No one else solved them. <laughs> you know, as obvious as they were. Well, you kind of have to be willing to do things like that, you know, no matter what the experts tell you, because the, the, whole, the whole world is kind of like status quo. And this was a nice, of course, immediately the industry adopted it, and there are hundreds, if not thousands of them in the oceans of the world today. That's the only way they build a supply boat. This supply boat cost about $100,000, this first one. We were 10 guys. We each put up $10,000 on the first one. Now they, they cost six, $8 million a piece and $10 oh million dollars a piece. On the drilling rigs, incidentally, I told you Mr. Charlie cost $2 million. One of the recent rigs I saw, deep water floating rig, is over $500 million. One rig? One rig. A half a billion dollars. Yeah. Things have gone up. <laughs> Things have gone a up. A little bit. And they have a lot of stuff on them that wasn't there. In Do you days. live in New Orleans? Yes. You also, like your brother, you both mm -hmm. live in this. You, you, you like it. You enjoy it. Yes, I never, again, gave a lot of thought. Of that was the obvious place to live. This was the headquarters of the company. We raised our children here. They went to school. They all live around here. So it just sort of happened. 
I asked your brother uh, uh, if uh, your mother and dad had gotten to see the uh, y'all's accomplishments. Let me put it modestly. And he said yes, that they had, you know, your father, I think, particularly had lived to see what, he, what his sons had done, which is a wonderful thing. Because had they not enjoyed or had an opportunity to enjoy what their progeny did, that would have been sad. Yes, they got a certain amount of it anyway. And uh, I know they came to the commissioning of some of our earlier offshore rigs and uh, they likewise some of the tidewater boats, I think. And I'm sure my father and mother didn't exactly understand what we were doing, but they, they thought it was all right. It was okay. Yeah. What, what, what do you do when you're not working, which is obviously not a lot of time? Well, I play golf once you or do? twice a week. Yes. And I, you know, I guess do the other things. I help my wife around the kitchen. and. The other night when you all were honored, uh, both you and your brother, at the Legends Banquet on the front row was none other than Archbishop Hammond. And he seemed to get as much pleasure out of uh, you all being honored, uh, as did anyone. He's a lovely man. Well, I'm flattered that you say that because he's a dear friend of mine and I'm an admirer and he's something of a role model. I'll say here for the record too, he's older than I am. <laughs> and uh, uh, I don't think that'll bother him, but he, he's a, you know, a great person and I've followed his career. And he works harder and longer and more than I do and he's three years older than I am, so I uh, I don't think I can hang up till he does. You told me the most interesting story that he had, without you knowing, driven to Baton Rouge from New Orleans by himself, and that made you outdone, I know. Well, it was. I hadn't <laughs> told him about this thing because I was afraid he would might do that, he but do. he found out somehow and didn't tell me anything, and he turned up there for the ceremony. And Doc, so I, was, I want to uh, thank you uh, for being on Louisiana Legends because you are, and on behalf of your fellow citizens of Louisiana for being a true Louisiana legend and, and in my humble opinion, a great man. I, I, I'm pretty good at reading those things, and you are. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. I enjoyed being with you. Louisiana Legends is made possible by Blue Cross and Blue Shield of Louisiana. This informative, educational series enables us to discover, through the accomplishments of our fellow Louisianians, the unique character of the state so proudly served by Blue Cross and Blue Shield of Louisiana for more than 65 years. For a copy of this program, call 1-800-973-7246 or go online to www.lpb.org.